President Putin has hailed his victory in Russia's presidential election, saying it would allow the country to become stronger. He had been the only serious candidate. Now has it was an election few doubted the outcome of. On March 17th, and with over 87% of the votes in his favor, President Vladimir Putin secured a fifth term in Russia, becoming the longest serving leader of the Federation since Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin. With most opposition candidates either dead, jailed, exiled or barred from running, the path was all clear, with no credible challenger to Putin's rule. So beyond official numbers, what do Russians really make of their leader? And is support for the war in Ukraine as strong as the Kremlin says it is? In this episode, we talk to Alexei Minyailo, a political activist in Moscow who started a project with social scientists and analysts to find out how the war with Ukraine is really being perceived in Russia. We're joined by Pavel Baev, a research professor at PRIO and an expert on Russian foreign policy. I am Arno Syad, and you're listening to PRIO's Peace in a Pod. Pavel, Alexei, welcome to this episode. Pavel, we catch up a few days after Vladimir Putin got re-elected by a landslide. I'm guessing you're not surprised about that outcome, but what did that election tell you about where Russia is heading? It is difficult to judge from this. It, I wouldn't call them even elections. It's more like special electoral operation, much the same way as Putin doesn't call the war by its name, uh, calling a special military operation. I think this is exactly what it was. And... Uh, well, it delivered the result he wanted. And from it, it's really hard really to judge where Russian public opinion is going, particularly from the distance. Maybe there are some insights in Moscow which can tell you. But overall, it is striking that the level of falsification, that the level of manipulation of these elections is record high. And it means that Putin and his courtiers and his henchmen don't really trust the expression of public opinion. Everything possible was done to deliver this result, which generally shows that they're not certain at all themselves where public mood is shifting, how it is changing, where the political winds are blowing. And this uncertainty on the top generally tells you that they are not certain at all that the kind of course so firmly set on on the uh, war with no end on the perpetual war is sustainable right uh, alexei you're in moscow i want to ask you what russians like you should expect from a fifth term of vladimir putin hopefully uh, we uh, shouldn't expect it to be a complete fifth term not all six years, but we will look forward uh, what will uh, eventually turn out. Uh, but uh, I would expect, of course, what uh, most Russians expect, uh, according to our surveys, uh, that uh, Putin will increase military spending, uh, that he will hold a new mobilization to send more people to fight in Ukraine, and uh, he will double on repressions because there is very few instruments that he can use to control the situation. The economy will deteriorate further, so he will have little option but to try to snuff out the dissent. Pavel, you often write op-eds for the Prio blog and other platforms about Russian foreign policy. Any change we should expect on Russia's relations with other countries and the West in particular? I think Alexei made a very interesting point that we cannot take six years for granted. And I had exactly the same feeling in the year 12 when Putin was uh, came back, so to say, into the presidency. I thought with that level of protest in Moscow, with that level of disagreement with his comeback, he cannot expect to continue for long. But then Crimea happened which changed a lot in the domestic political dynamics. 
So now we are in a situation where, again, he cannot take six years uh, for granted because the war is a war. It generates a lot of uncertainty and sustainability of the current effort is very doubtful. Uh, whatever repressions he can discharge in, uh, internally, it cannot really guarantee his security against his own elites. There are too many losers in the elites. And for the elite... The dubious public support for him is too obvious. Uh, the, I think from these elections, one conclusion the elites can draw is that if suddenly Putin disappears, nobody would be shocked or nobody would come out to protest. And if this disappearance is accompanied by political message about ending the war, there will be great sigh of public relief. Uh, great support from many uh, social uh, groups for the closure of this disastrous chapter. Of course, as we talk about that election, as we know, there was no credible challenger to Vladimir Putin. Alexei Navalny, one of the most prominent Kremlin critics, died on the 16th of February while incarcerated in a prison north of the Arctic Circle. Alexei, you worked closely with one of Navalny's close collaborators, and in 2019 you were arrested on charges of involvement in mass riots as part of your work with his team, I believe. You were ultimately released from custody after two months. Can I ask about what his death meant to you? Uh, you know, it's not an easy question. Uh, it was hard. And uh, I, I don't know if I, uh, you know, so sometimes when I see some notes about it, uh, sometimes I get struck like, did it really happen? That's on the one hand, of course, it's uh, emotionally, it's not very easy. We were not close. We knew each other, but we were not close. Uh, but still, it was, uh, it was hard. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I can't say that it changed anything. We knew that Putin kills his political opponents. He already tried to kill Alexei once and failed. And it was conceivable that he will try to do it the next time because now Navalny is in uh, completely under Putin's control that this time might be successful. So it was not altogether unexpected or a thing that really changes anything in hopes of civil society because uh, as important as Navalny is and was democracy does not depend on on a single person it is a heavy loss and it, it doesn't really change our aspirations or uh, what we're trying to do or how we are doing it because it was uh, if not expected it was predictable unfortunately. Right. And as you just said, it's not about one person. But of course, there will be many looking for an alternative, credible figure to sort of unify the opposition and symbolize it, right, in Russia. And some have mentioned Yulia Navalnaya, the wife of Alexei Navalny, as the new face potentially of that opposition to Vladimir Putin. I will continue to Alexei Navalny. Продолжать бороться за нашу с вами страну, и я призываю вас стать рядом со мной. Разделить не только горе. The way perhaps Svetlana Chikanuskaya has come to symbolize Belarusian opposition after her husband was in prison. Do you see a future for that happening? Do you see her potentially managing to unify Russians behind her? It is possible, but uh, the time will tell. Uh, you know, uh, such things are not hereditary. And uh, Tikhanovska did not inherit uh, the title from her husband. She earned it. So we'll see if the same will be uh, true. But anyway, all the talk about democracy is not about who is in charge of Russian opposition or who is the key symbolic figure or something, something like that. Uh, it's about empowering as many people to act for the sake of democracy as possible. And uh, Navalny was very successful in that. And now uh, there are a lot of people uh, who are uh, in prison for being uh, Navalny's associates. So that's one sign of uh, him being successful, empowering other people who acted on their own in the regions uh, or in Moscow, uh, promoting democracy and fighting for people's rights and interests. It's important that whoever, so to say, succeeds uh, Alexei is even more successful in this than he was. Right. And 
as you talk about this, I'm basically wondering how can we really know what the Russians are really making of all of this? I mean, as the full-scale invasion of Ukraine started, you became concerned that Russian pollsters would struggle to adjust their methods to a wartime environment. In other words, you can't really do regular polling in a country at war like Russia. And you and social scientist, Alexei, started a research project called Chronicles, I believe, where you try to understand just how supportive Russians really are of the war in Ukraine. What have you found? We have found that the situation is much more complex than it might look at the first glance. So imagine one big mistake that uh, many social scientists make, and many people both within Russia and abroad, uh, they take the numbers that are often published for granted at face value. Imagine that you live in New York and you have a hand watch. You know that it might be a little bit off, like several seconds off or one minute off, then you just adjust it a little bit and it shows exact time. And you can tell night and day using the watch, you have a lot of experience with it, it works. Uh, So you decide to come to Moscow and you arrive to Moscow and you see it's 3 p.m. on your watch, but it's pitch dark, pitch black. So the thing is, you didn't account for uh, different time zones. Because in Moscow, when it's 3 p.m. in New York, in Moscow it's night. So, similar thing happened here. Some things that work in democracies, in electoral democracies. One good example is rating of president's approval. Uh, which percentage of the population approves of the president? In electoral democracies, this thing matters because people can vote for the person they approve of and they can vote against the person they don't approve of. And there can be certain actions that people don't approve of, and it matters uh, in a democracy because a person, an elected person, can lose power if his actions are not approved by a large percentage of the population. So uh, in Russia, things are different. Once again, let's turn to America. Imagine what are Russian elections and approval ratings of uh, Vladimir Putin. Imagine that there are two competitors in the elections in the US, Donald Trump and John Doe. Nobody knows who John Doe is, except that he was involved in some sexual harassment. He never did anything good in his life. Uh, Like he's not known for that anyway. Uh, So uh, I wonder what would be the rating of uh, Donald Trump in such situation. Maybe it would be 88%, like uh, Putin claims to have uh, received at the elections, or 86% as uh, Levada Center uh, names uh, the rating of Vladimir Putin. So the thing is that Putin's regime is what is called by political scientists spin dictatorship, which means it's based on lies and clever lies at that. So when social scientists say that Putin's approval rating is high, like 80% or something, they're not lying. But the situation is so much different that it just makes no sense. People literally see Putin and some dirty freaks or, you know, clowns around him. Of course, they approve of Putin because the only alternatives they're shown are some utterly dumb people or very unpleasant people or, you know, political gnomes or something else. So you cannot look at the same numbers that you look at in democracies and expect that they mean the same thing. You have to look at different things. And then if you look at different things, you get very different results and different understanding of the situation. So just for our listeners to understand, one pollster from Russia that is often quoted in the West is the Levada Center, which you just mentioned, right? Right. And it's self-described as independent. They usually use focus groups and big sample sizes. And their most recent poll around the election showed Putin's approval rating indeed at 86%, as you mentioned. I don't think this number is meaningful in a way people in electoral democracies think. Uh, This number can be used by social scientists to combine with some other numbers and get some interesting result. But... This number on its own doesn't actually mean that these people have some active support or that they will come to the polling stations and vote or that they say that they approve of Putin because they support his policy. No, they say that they approve of Putin because 
uh, first, is dangerous to say otherwise. Second, because there is literally no one else whom you can be supportive of. If you don't use VPN, you don't see any real politicians who have political programs or anything else. You only see some strange people who you don't even know how got there. So uh, the, this number means very different things. But people are mostly not aware of that, neither in Russia nor in the West. All right. So that goes for Putin's approval rating. But what do we know, especially from your research and your studies, how Russians tend to feel towards the war in Ukraine? Yes. Actually, our research uh, can tell something about uh, how people feel about Putin's political course. We also uh, hold focus groups and we make representative uh, phone surveys. Uh, with uh, typically uh, 1,600 respondents. And in our most recent one, we've been asking respondents about what they want to happen in the next year and what they expect in the next year if Putin wins. And we saw very interesting things, that when asked about their wishes, more than half Russians say that they want the government to concentrate on home affairs. That's 83% of Russians want that. Truce with Ukraine, 58%. Sanctions lifted, 56%. And relationships with the Western countries restored, 51%. So if you combine that, more than half of Russian population wants a political course which is totally opposite to what Vladimir Putin does. So that tells something about uh, how really sympathetic Russians are about Putin's political course, about things he will do, he's doing, and he will keep doing. That's one thing. The second thing is you should keep in mind that electoral system is completely controlled by Vladimir Putin. And he didn't allow to participate in the elections Yekaterina Dunsova, who is a provincial journalist. I never heard of her before she put forward her name to try to become the candidate for presidency. So how do you think a person who enjoys mass approval and mass support of the population up to 86% or something, will he be afraid to allow to participate a provincial journalist who has no money, no connections, who is little known uh, even to people who are very interested in politics and very active in politics like myself? I don't think so. So we should change our perspective. Same goes for support for the war. It is true that a majority of Russians answer yes to the question, do you support the war? Do you support uh, the special military operation in Ukraine? How it is usually spelled. But this number doesn't mean what people might think it means. And actually, if we ask additional questions, very quickly we get an understanding that the majority of people who say so do that under probably under the influence of social instinct, trying to join what they think the majority is, because that's a uh, social instinct of the human beings. For example, uh, you might think that if a person says that he or she supports the special military operation, then probably this person wants that Russia wins the war, so that the goals of the special military operation are fulfilled and is ready to wait till this happens. But actually, not all people who uh, speak out in support of the war think so. And we've offered the question, if Vladimir Putin decides to pull out from Ukraine without reaching the goals of special military operation, would you support that decision or would you not support that decision? And we see that 39% wouldn't support that decision, while also 39% would support such a decision. And many among the supporters would support the decision to withdraw without reaching military goals. And what does it mean? If you invade, don't reach your goals and withdraw, it means you've lost. So a significant portion of those who declare support for the war, they would uh, support also, well, let's call it a civilized loss. Uh, not, not when the army uh, just uh, runs home in panic, but when uh, the troops are pulled out in a civilized way. Or you might think that people understand that war means a lot of expenses and they are supportive of their government increasing these expenses in favor of, of the military budget. But actually, the majority of Russians is against this. Uh, when we ask respondents, uh, in your opinion, 
the government's priority should be social budget or military budget. The majority of Russians state that social budget should be a priority, not a military one. And 2024 is the first year since the Soviet time when Siloviki budget, the budget for security and the army, is bigger than the social budget. So what I'm understanding from you is that there is that disconnect between what the average Russian is thinking and what the Kremlin is focusing on. Alexei, you are dedicating your work to reconciling Russians with the idea of a democratic Russia, but you've written that sanctions from the West aren't helping. The EU just adopted its 13th package of sanctions a few weeks ago. Your team is currently working on a project that seeks to show Russians what everyday life in a democratic Russia might be like. So can you talk to us about that? And how could the West help the work of pro-democratic and anti-war activists in Russia generally? Indeed. Let me first talk about what the West would change in its policy towards Russia to make democracy more probable, because ultimately I think that it will be very good. It will be a pure win-win scenario for the West, for Ukraine and for Russia if Russia returns to the democratic path. Because democratic Russia, of course, will not have war with Ukraine or war with Sweden or with Finland or something like that. And we see that from our data that people are not supportive of that and uh, that they are not going to support any new invasion. So if we talk about this in a paradigm of stick and carrot, sanctions are the stick. But what is completely lacking from the Western policy towards Russia is a carrot. So there are very few people who got sanctions lifted from themselves. There is totally no proposal how sanctions can be lifted from Russia in return for what conditions can the sanctions be lifted. For example, the occupation of Ukraine, discussing reparations, trials over military criminals, and so on. And that makes our job much harder because uh, people who are in power, they think, okay, let's assume Putin steps away or you know goes off one way or the other. Let's put it like that. What will happen to us? Uh, let's imagine that we take power after his demise. Uh, we have no knowledge that lifting the sanctions is possible. Uh, in such a case, we will come down very quickly because without sanctions lifted, we will not be able to restore the economy. And the economy degrading faster and faster uh, will lead to us being just removed, jailed, slaughtered, and so on. So these people think, Okay, we will not do anything because Putin is our best bet. We have no alternative proposal. Remember what we were talking about uh, Putin being the only alternative. The sanctions do the same thing. And lack of any proposal about how sanctions can be lifted make Putin the best bet for Russian establishment. And without establishment switching to the pro-democracy side, there is no chance for democratization. It doesn't happen anywhere. Only when establishment steps in, like in Ukraine during the Maidan, only then change is possible. So that's about what the West could do. But of course, the main task, and the task that only Russians can do, is present to Russians, to peoples who inhabit Russia, image of the future that would be beneficial for these people. Uh, so we are now working to create a platform that would enable specialists and activists to work together uh, to work out the solution for these problems and uh, presenting Russians with how they can be solved, created collectively with active participation of ordinary people, that might be a way to politicize people, to uh, invite people to talk about politics and to make them understand that future might not be scary, actually, uh, because that's one of the things that Putin is using. He says that without him, the future is super scary, that Russia will be dismembered by the West, that everything that will crumble and so on and so forth. And we must understand that to uh, quite the opposite. Once Russia stops attacking its neighbors and concentrates on home affairs, life will change for the better very quickly. A remedy to political apathy. Alexei Pavel, thank you very much. This episode was produced by Arno Siad and edited by Bragi Pedersen with sound from the BBC. Find out more about our op-eds, events, policy briefs and cutting-edge research at prio.org. <laughs>